Hello everyone, my name is Uddhavani and I will start my video lecture series with the male reproductive system and in our further lectures we will also discuss about the female reproductive system as well. I will specifically focus on the endocrine aspects of this chapter because they are very high yield as well as confusing for the students as well. So I am beginning with the male reproductive system and for that I will have to go to the hypothalamus which is the part of diencephalon and in turn this diencephalon is the part of the brain. So, there is a hypothalamus which is the part of diencephalon and the diencephalon is the part of the brain. This hypothalamus releases various releasing as well as inhibiting factors. These factors travel via the hypothalamus hypophysial portal system and reach the anterior pituitary. So, this is the anterior pituitary. These hormones, the hypothalamic hormones, reach the anterior pituitary and there they cause either the release or the inhibition of various hormones. One such hypothalamic hormone is the gonadotrophin releasing hormone. This gonadotrophin releasing hormone, after it reaches the anterior pituitary, causes the release of two important hormones. One is the luteinizing hormone, and the one is the follicle stimulating hormone. Okay, now I have made such kind of a diagram because obviously this pituitary gland is an endocrine gland, so it will release its secretions into the blood, and that blood will carry these hormones to the testes because. These gonadotropins will act on the gonads, and in males, the gonads are testers. So, now this picture is of the testers. This is the capillary supplying the tissue of the te testers. Okay. Now, I have made the structure of the testers. First, we should understand this before proceeding further. See, within the histology of the testers, you should know that there are various tubules which are known as seminiferous tubules. So, there are rounds of structures which are known as seminiferous tubules. And so one such seminiferous tubule is this, another one is this. Okay. Between this seminiferous tubule, there is a space known as interstitial space. So this hole is a space known as interstitial space. Okay. So this hole is an interstitial space, and this is one seminiferous tubule, and this is another seminiferous tubule. Okay. Within the interstitial space, there is a cell known as leading cells, or the interstitial cells of leading, because they are present in the interstitial space. Okay, and within the seminiferous tubules, its lining is formed by certain cells known as Sertoli cells. So Sertoli cells form the lining of the seminiferous tubules, while as the leading cells are present within the interstitial space. And you should know that the blood capillaries are present within the interstitial space. So this is the interstitial space, and within this interstitial space, there is a blood capillary which will carry the hormones, luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone. Now these two hormones, that is the luteinizing hormone and the follicle stimulating hormone, are the peptide hormones. So their receptors will obviously be present on the surface of the cell. Okay. The receptor for the luteinizing hormone is present on the surface of the cell known as Leydig cells, while as the receptor for the follicle stimulating hormone is present on the Sertoli cell. Okay. Now we will discuss about their functions separately. First we will discuss about the luteinizing hormone. This luteinizing hormone after it stimulates the leading cells, it will cause the release of two important hormones. One is testosterone, another one is the dihydrotestosterone. Okay, and this dihydrotestosterone is actually produced from the testosterone itself in the presence of an important enzyme known as 5 alpha reductase. Okay, so the leading cells, after they are stimulated from the luteinizing hormone, they release two hormones one is testosterone, another one is the dihydrotestosterone. We'll first discuss about the functions of these two hormones, then we'll proceed towards the functions of the Sertoli cells and the secretions of the Sertoli cells. We'll also discuss about their functions as well. Now, I'll be telling you about the function of the dihydrotestosterone. This dihydrotestosterone, as I told you, is formed by converting testosterone into the dihydrotestosterone in the presence of an enzyme known as 5 alpha reductase. Okay. This dihydrotestosterone is actually a more active form of the testosterone. Okay. One tenth of the testosterone is present in the form of dihydrotestosterone, but most of the biological functions or its functions are carried out by the dihydrotestosterone. So, what I mean to say is only one tenth of testosterone is present in the form of dihydrotestosterone, but most of the functions of the testosterone are carried out by the dihydrotestosterone. Okay. The functions of dihydrotestosterone vary 
um, embryonic life and the adult life. During the embryonic life, it will help us in the development of penis, prostate and scrotum. So during the embryonic life, it will help us in the formation of three things, penis, prostate and the scrotum. But during the adult life, it will lead to two conditions, one being the male pattern baldness and another one being the benign prostatic hyperplasia. This is an important question. <clears throat> you may be asked a question like, a 30 year old male comes to an OPD with a <clears throat> condition of a male pattern baldness, what is the most common cause? Most of the people go with the option decreased estrogen. They think that in males, the level of estrogen is almost negligible, therefore the male pattern baldness develops. But that's not the correct option. Correct option is dihydrotestosterone. Okay, so dihydrotestosterone leads to male pattern baldness and also with the benign prostate hyperplasia. <coughs> now, there is an important link to the pharma or pharmacology, and it's nowadays a trend of asking uh, combined questions like uh, pathology related to physiology or physiology related to pharmacology. Likewise, so we have <coughs> discussed about two important cases of pharmacology related to the dihydrotestosterone which may be asked as a potential question. First one being the 5-alpha reductase. Now this 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, this actually inhibits what? 5-alpha reductase. Okay, so this inhibits 5-alpha reductase, therefore prevents the conversion of testosterone into dihydrotestosterone. Okay, so as it will prevent the formation of dihydrotestosterone, therefore it will treat the conditions of male pattern baldness and the benign prostatic hyperplasia. So 5-alpha reductase inhibitors are used to treat male pattern baldness and the benign prostatic hyperplasia. One example of 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is finasteride. Okay, and there's an important question that finasteride is used as a therapy or the combination of therapy for the transgender females. Because obviously, we don't want a transgender female to have a male pattern baldness. So in order to get rid of that, we use finasteride as a <clears throat> part of the therapy. Okay. Now, this 5-alpha reductase inhibitor is often, very often confused with alpha adrenergic blocking agents. Why? Because in both the names, there is alpha. And both of the two things help in subsidizing the effect of benign prostatic hyperplasia. Because obviously, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors inhibit or uh, reduce the symptoms of benign prostatic hyperplasia. But Alpha adrenergic uh, blocking agents also reduce the functions of uh, or the effects of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So we often confuse these two because their name is quite similar and also their function is quite similar. Okay, the examples of alpha adrenergic blocking agents are pyrazosine, dioxazine, and dioxazine. Pyrazosine, dioxazine, and dioxazine. Okay, but. <clears throat> There is an important thing that this alpha adrenergic blocking agent is used to treat lower urinary tract symptoms. So it treats lower urinary tract symptoms while as the 5-alpha <coughs> reductase inhibitor treats the overall symptoms of the benign prostatic hyperplasia. So that is the difference. You should not get confused between 5-alpha reductase inhibitors and the alpha adrenergic blocking agents because these are quite different things. Okay, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors uh, reduce the overall symptoms of the benign prostatic hyperplasia while as the alpha adrenergic blocking agents only reduce the symptoms like within the, in the benign prostatic hyperplasia you'll find the symptoms of uh, the passage of urine uh, which is drop by drop okay so that hmm, symptom is reduced by giving alpha adrenergic blocking agents and there's an important thing you should know that pyrazosine is not given in this alpha adrenergic <coughs> sorry in treating the benign prostatic hyperplasia why because of its BP lowering property. So because of its BP lowering property, it's not given to the <coughs> patients of uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Okay, now we'll discuss about <coughs> the functions of testosterone. So we complete the function of the testosterone. Now we'll be discussing about the functions of testosterone. Now, after discussing about the functions of the higher testosterone, we will discuss about the functions of testosterone. It's actually a male androgen. Testosterone is actually male androgen. And it has very functions, very, very important functions. But we have mm, two, four functions which are uh, very important with respect to our clinical questions. Okay. So the functions are supermatogenesis. Another one is bone and muscle growth. 
another one is development of primary and secondary sexual characters and another one is increasing the pmr so these are the important functions of testosterone now there's a clinical topic related to this these functions that is the methyl testosterone this methyl testosterone is actually an anabolic steroid it's taken by the athletes so why the athletes take this because you know that testosterone is important for bone and muscle development obviously athletes will want to have uh, stronger muscles so athletes take this which is actually a synthetic form of testosterone so it is a synthetic form of testosterone okay so this methyl testosterone is a synthetic form of testosterone which is taken by the athletes in order to develop their muscles and also in order to increase their bmr okay but you should know that this that is the methyl testosterone leads to testicular atrophy that is it reduces the size of your testicles so the people who take methyl testosterone may have muscles uh, of the size of an animal but their testicles will be as minute as it can be okay so um, the people which take methyl testosterone the most common side effect is testicular atrophy okay so that's a clinical question related to the testosterone you should know this after discussing about the functions of uh, testosterone and the dihyl testosterone you should also know that their high levels that whenever their levels become high they will send a negative feedback mechanism or they will send a negative feedback inhibition to the anterior pituitary and will cause the inhibition of the secretion of luteinizing hormone okay so these two hormones whenever their level becomes high they will send a negative feedback and that will inhibit the secretion of luteinizing hormone okay so we have completed the study of uh, leydig cells and its secretions okay now we will be discussing about the sertoli cells and i told you that the sertoli cells line the seminiferous tubules okay now there's an important thing about the sertoli cells and that is sertoli cells are actually stimulated by two important hormones one is the follicular stimulating hormone obviously and that is it has a surface receptor for the follicular stimulating hormone and another one is a nuclear receptor for testosterone because testosterone is a steroid hormone okay so its receptor will be present on the nucleus so the receptor for the testosterone is present on the nucleus of the sertoli cells okay so the receptor of the testosterone is present on the nucleus so it may be asked as a question that the nuclear receptor of the sertoli cell is for your answer should be testosterone most of the people go with the follicular stimulating answer uh, hormone but that's the wrong answer okay you should know that thing after knowing this much you should know that these two stimulations that is follicular stimulating hormone as well as the testosterone stimulation to the sertoli cell cause the release of certain hormones one being the growth factors now the growth factors are involved in various steps of spermatogenesis so for various steps of spermatogenesis we require growth factors okay another one being the androgen binding protein so the another important secretion of the sertoli cells is the androgen binding protein this important protein binds to testosterone and increase its levels within the seminiferous tubules because we require high amount of testosterone for the spermatogenesis to take place okay so this androgen binding protein binds to testosterone and increases its levels within the seminiferous tubules okay after that there is an important thing that follicular stimulating hormone activates an androgen hormone sorry enzyme known as aromatase okay so the follicular stimulating hormone activates aromatase and this aromatase in turn converts testosterone into the estradiol okay so aromatase being activated by the follicular stimulating hormone converts testosterone into the estradiol okay now you must be thinking that what are the functions of estradiol in males because obviously the female sex hormone so what are its functions in males see estradiol has three important functions one is maintenance of libido second one is uh, in penile erection and third thing is in the various steps of spermatogenesis so it is important three things one being the steps of spermatogenesis another one being the penile erection another one being the maintenance of libido 
Actually, this enzyme aromatase is present within brain or uh, even the penis <coughs> or the testes where it converts testosterone into the estradiol. Okay. Now, what are the functions of the estradiol? I have already told you. Okay. So, three things. One is penile erection, second one is maintenance of libido, and third one is the supermetogenesis. So it's obviously true that behind a very strong man, there is a female, and here is that female. Okay. Now there is a very important thing regarding this estradiol, that it's only one third production is from the testes. Remaining two third production is from the fatty tissues. So in case of fatty males, there you will see the male <coughs> breast of the gynecomastia. So within the males having a fatty body, their the levels of estradiol will be obviously high and thus they will develop gynecomastia. So that's an important thing you should know that it may be asked as a question. So it's also asked as a question that estradiol or you can be asked like this that the male breast develop because of which of the following hormone that is estradiol. Okay, so that's all about the hormones of uh, Sertoli cells, one is the growth of the factor, second is androgenic protein, the third is estradiol. There is also an important hormone known as N7B. This N7B sends a negative feedback to the anterior pituitary and causes the inhibition of the secretion of follicle stimulating hormone. Okay, so these are the hormonal functions of the Sertoli cells. But there is another important function of the Sertoli cell and that is the formation of blood testes back. Now it's me. See, there are various cytoplasmic processes. So this is a cytoplasmic process of one Sartori cell. This is the cytoplasmic process of another Sartori cell. Okay, so these are bound by the tight junction. The here is the tight junction. So this tight junction binds two cytoplasmic processes of two Sartori cells and divides the compartment uh, divides it into two compartments. One being the basal compartment. This basal compartment facing the basal lamina because this is the basal lamina of the seminiferous tubules. So this basal compartment faces the basal lamina. Another one compartment being the as luminal compartment because it faces the lumen. This here is lumen because it's a circular structure and you will find over here there is a lumen and here is the basal lamina. So this is known as basal compartment. This is known as luminal compartment and it's the blood testis barrier. Now for what thing we require this blood testis barrier? I'll explain it over here. Let's explain it over here. <coughs> See, there, there I have explained the various steps of supermetogenesis. You should know that within the seminiferous tubules, there are certain cells known as supermetogonia, which are the primordial germ cells. These supermetogonia divide by mitosis into two cells, one being the A and the one being the type B. So these are both primary supermetogonia. This is type A, type B. Both are diploid because the diploid cell divided by mitosis. Now, this A is recycled again and it can again divide into A and B cell. However, the B cell is transported into the adluminal compartment. Now, why this happens? Because after this step, there will be mitosis first and mitosis first is a reduction of division. So there will be the reduction of the chromosome number. Till now it was a diploid stage, but now it will be a haploid stage. Okay, so now it will be a haploid stage, and you should know that haploid stage or the haploid cells are attacked by our immune system because our immune system recognizes haploid cells as the <coughs> foreign cells. Okay, so it will act or it will attack our sperm cells. So in order to separate the haploid stage from the direct contact with the blood, we have formed this blood testis barrier. So that's another important function of the Sertoli cells. And obviously, after that, they will divide by mitosis too and will form four supermetids and they will attach to the wall of the seminiferous tubules and there, testosterone will act on them and also certain growth factors and will obviously form the supermetazoa. Okay, so that's everything about the male reproductive endocrinology and also we have discussed about certain important questions that have been asked about this chapter. That's everything about the male reproductive system and in our next lecture we'll discuss about the female reproductive system. Okay, in case you have any doubt regarding this chapter, you can ask me in the comment section and in case you like my work, please subscribe to my channel and also press the bell icon so whenever I upload the next video, you'll get notified. Thank you everyone and have a nice day.